front of you uh, the biographies, but if I say that Professor Beddington was appointed the Government Gene Scientific Officer in 2008, he is a Fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, prior to his appointment, he was the Professor of Applied Population Biology at Imperial College, uh, and he currently advises not only our government, but governments across the globe uh, on issues to do with the environment. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, it's a curious time to be lecturing to anybody, and I was going to call it the graveyard shift, but then I thought that probably talks about sort of a foreshortened morbidity or something in a way that would be rather unhelpful. Um, I am, as Sarah's indicated, going to be talking at a very different level. I'd just like to make some remarks uh, how sort of moving I found the, the previous speakers. And uh, it, um, it focuses, in a way, on the sort of personal levels, which I'm not going to be talking about tonight, but they are enormously important. I'm going to give you something which you're all very familiar with, um, which is the world population development, you know, showing the sort of exponential growth. Um, when I was an academic, one of the questions I used to ask uh, my students was, are there more people alive than dead? I think, interesting question. And it depends a little bit on the, deta on the fine detail of what happened after Adam and Eve, really. Um, but um, uh, and I won't go in to try and answer it. But that's the sort of characteristic picture. And actually, the point I'm wanting to make this evening is one, one of the points I wanted to make this evening is actually we are living in a unique time for humanity. Because if you look at the projection from 2000 onwards, demographers, a bit like economists, don't always agree on detail. But there is a, a growing consensus that somewhere around the middle of this century, maybe a little later, maybe a little earlier, somewhere around 9 or 10 billion, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, the world population is actually going to start to flatten out and it's arguably may even decline. And that's never happened before. It's, in a sense, it's rather frightening. Um, it's challenging, but it does afford the possibility of what one might call halcyon days, that we could live within the capacity of our planet, that could, we could live in a way that we don't destroy the environment, where we can have some degree of equitability, whether it is across uh, races or countries or indeed ages and so it's it is an unprecedented time this century and they're going to be I think opportunities challenges and real difficulties I'm going to focus initially on some of the issues uh, and the drivers that are out there two drivers I'm at the Institute of Aging and um, I'm I would be uh, reticent to talk about aging but it is a major issue and I'm going to call, talk a little bit later, right at the end, about really the, the potential of um, the differential in ageing across the um, world continents. Urbanisation is another massive driver, and uh, the speaker before the last one was talking about how one country has actually driven it. And the urbanisation is a major driver, is one in which we're, have, we're looking at, um, for the first time in, huma in history, the uh, urban population exceeds the rural, and indeed the projections are that the rural population is going to decline. And although, that I, although I pointed out that um, this century is going to see probably for the first time ever a flattening out of world population growth, um, the growth between now and that, and that peaking is really quite frightening. Um, it is something of the order of six million a month. Um, you're looking at a population in 2030, 19 years away, about eight and a half, 8.3, 8.8 8 and a half billion. And that is happening. A lot of that population will be, growth will be, and there'll be big differentials between different continents. Essentially, to a good approximation, the OECD will, will stay stagnant or decline. Africa will somewhere between increase by a factor of two, two and a half or three. And urbanisation is also there, because much of, the, much of the patterns of population change are going to be a concentration, particularly in Africa and Asia, on cities. In Africa, for example, um, the expectation is that it will be cities around about 500,000 people, in Asia about a million people. And this is something that we just have never really observed before. These are the massive drivers that are actually affecting the world. And the other driver is a shame on our society, because we have got three massive sources of poverty. 
The first one, which people are well aware of, not as well aware of as they should be, arguably, are the sort of what Paul Collier, from the economist from here, from Oxford, has called the bottom billion. And there's something of the order of a billion people who are genuinely not going to bed with sufficient food to enable their development to occur, both uh, physically and mentally. In addition, there's another billion people or so who don't have adequate nutrition. So give or take two billion people have really difficult problems in terms of their poverty and their inability to get access to food. There's something like a billion people, a little more, and this and 884 is ludicrously spurious accuracy. Uh, forgive me for that. Um, you have to put a number on the slide, um, but uh, you've got something of the order of uh, eight, 900 million people who lack access to clean water at the moment. And something of the order of 1.4 billion people are actually in energy poverty. They have insufficient, they don't have access to electricity and they have insufficient access to energy. And that is a most, a most extraordinary problem for that world community, which as I said, we have a chance to address, but we don't have, we have got relatively short time to do it because there are real problems out there. Let me take you through a couple more because let me just give you an indication of something that is actually a good, but it presents us with real problems. The good is that actually primarily in Asia, but also to an extent in Africa and to a greater extent in South America, people are getting less poor. There is a trend that the world, not the whole world, there's still that bottom billion people or so, but the, that there is an increasing prosperity in the world. And to give you an indication of it, the 2006 figure is that in 2006, there was something of the order of 350 million households in the developing world with an income per household of more than 8,000 pounds. Projection by 2030, and this is a good thing, is that this is going to go up by about 2.1 billion households with incomes there. So a factor of six increase in the, pur in the arguably the purchasing power of what you might turn lower middle class and middle class people in the developing world. A good thing, but it presents really big challenges. So these are some of the big drivers. And the third driver, of course, is climate change. And that is a failure at the moment. There is, was an agreement somewhere in Copenhagen to actually look, hold the increase in global temperatures to somewhere around two degrees. Oh, that's very good then, isn't it? But of course, nobody actually had any legally binding agreement or took any decisions that actually affected it. 70 countries have submitted some reduction um, targets, and in Cancun, um, afterwards, essentially the plan to, to have a target of two degrees was agreed, but again, no legally binding agreement, and really no legally binding agreement on the uh, foreseeable future. American Congress are not going to let any legislation go through that involves significant cutbacks of greenhouse gases, and indeed, large, large proportion of uh, some American politicians don't even believe it's happening. Um, the, th the fourth issue, of course, is that there are some things, and I'm going to come on to that a little later, but there has been some breakthroughs. Um, for there, the issue on forestry, the RED program, was a breakthrough. In a sense, it meant that the developed world was paying the developing world not to chop down its forests. Um, you would get a benefit in the developing world from chopping down your forests, so this is a substitute and is a, pro and a proper way of dealing with it. But what I'm going to focus on a little bit later is there's no, addre no addressing in the UN system, in the climate change discussions, about, about agriculture. And this is going to be the most fundamentally important issue, I believe, over the next two decades. Climate change, we worry about it. Let's think about the two degree problem. Two degrees, well first of all, what, is a two, what does two degrees mean? Um, two degrees for the world as a whole, so everybody goes up two degrees? Well no, it's an average, it averages the continents, it averages the oceans, and there are big differences between um, um, different latitudes in the world. And a two degree increase will, be a, will not be easy. There will be increased frequency of major floods and storms, that's simple physics, it'll happen. There will be an increase in, in, the, short, in um, the shortages that we'll see with water. There will be some significant in food impacts in terms of production. And there's going to be some real problems which are due with what, we, what the 
Um, the jargon calls tipping points, but basically means that in the Arctic um, and in the tundra, you will see uh, in temperature increases which are actually significantly greater than the average. So if it, the world average is two degrees, to a good approximation, what's going to happen in the north and the Arctic and the, and the uh, northern tundra is about a four degree increase. So it, and that will mean that um, vegetation that's currently frozen will melt and that greenhouse gases, primarily methane, will go into the atmosphere and prevent a pos provide a positive feedback. But if two degrees is problematic, four degrees is disastrous. Now, this is a slightly complicated slide, and forgive me, you know, um, but I'll take a little while to go through it. First of all, the average. I pointed out, that let's think about an average four degree rise. Well, this was done by our own, uh, by the UK Hadley Centre, and there's a lot of uncertainty in climate change, so they, they actually operated on optimistic, middle, and pessimistic scenarios in terms of unknown parameters or parameters that you can only poorly estimate in the climate system. So this is a range of something about like, something like 27, 28 models. Um, and the most optimistic, um, let us take the Arctic, those white figures are the temperatures on land in the Arctic. The most optimistic said that a four degree rise would imply eight degrees in the Arctic. A most pessimistic would be 16 degrees. The reasons why the Arctic um, is more susceptible is a mixture of, the, of this sort of structure of the Earth's mass, the structure of the Earth's oceans and so on, I won't go into it. But if four degrees, if two degrees was difficult, four degrees would be completely disastrous. You would see effectively a melting of the Arctic ice cap. You would see massive increases in the production of methane from the tundra. You would see big increases in sea level rises. You would see big changes and the, the circles, and of course they're not circles, they're representations, they're represented by circles, but you're seeing issues of, of crop yields decrease, massive dangers of forest fires, and significant problems in food production, and indeed the way in which the humanity can actually live in this. And I think it's challengeable whether in fact it is possible for humanity to actually survive in the same way that we see it, in the sort of loosely lit, knit society that we have on a four degree rise. And at the moment, that's got to be the best bet because we have not seen reductions in greenhouse gas emissions on anything like an international scale. And giving you an idea of the most pessimistic and the most optimistic, when might this happen? Well, the most optimistic would say that given no real change in the uh, emissions, would say that this might happen around about uh, two th um, 2110. The most pessimistic say about 2160. Obviously, the expectation is somewhere in between. Um, 2160 probably will see me out, even if the care of this ageing man has been improved dramatically. Um, so, but I, I do have grandchildren, and, I, and they will, help, I hope, have children themselves. We have got to worry about this, and we need to be thinking about acting now. Now, a, few year, a couple of years back, I put together the ideas that I've been point, pointing out in terms of the challenges to the world, which is food security, water security, energy security, and climate change. And I call that a perfect storm. The drivers are on the left, the population increase I've talked about, the increasing urbanization, the fact that poverty is being partially alleviated, and if we alleviate it dramatically, the demands on resources will be enormous, and of course climate change. And I put it in this sort of slick little diagram. Um, it's quite useful as chief scientific advisor to occasionally have something that people say, oh, remember, oh, I remember he did the perfect storm. You know? uh, and, um, but it, it, it tells a very important story. It points to the fundamental interaction of these, what I believe are the four major challenges that we face. The food security, something like a 40% increase by 2030, unless poverty is going to get worse. Energy, 40% again by about 2030. And, and, and available fresh water needs to increase by something like 30%. So, and these things are fundamentally interacting. You can't address climate change without worrying about water and energy and food. You can't address food without worrying about water or energy or climate change. These things are f have got to be challenges that are addressed together. 
And it is facile to think that you can avoid, you can say, oh, we must concentrate on water or we must concentrate on food. This is nonsense. It's intellectual nonsense and it's dangerous nonsense. Let me talk about the food system. Um, currently, and this is to point on the interaction, agriculture is consuming about 70% of global water. So the interaction between food and water is very strong. Um, in the developing world, it's actually much higher than 70%, um, something like 85%. Um, and there are massive problems. It's not. Aquifers, I'll come back to in a little more detail later to water, so I'll dwell on it, but we are exploiting some of the major world aquifers um, vastly over, at vastly over-exploited rates, and water of the, of the age of 300, 400, up to 1,000 years is being used for irrigation. The aquifers are being are overexploited. We've also managed to significantly degrade our land. Um, of the 11.5 billion or so vegetated land, again, beware spurious accuracy. I don't know whether it's 24% or 23.8 or indeed 27. But a significant proportion of the order of a quarter has undergone significant um, degradation. And also agriculture is not really sustainable because it is actually producing about 10 to 12 percent of greenhouse gas emissions in a variety of ways. It's not just livestock producing methane, but in fact it's due to the use of fossil fuels for fertilizers and so on. So the food system is actually failing on the basis of sustainability, but it's also failing the world. This is um, a, quite a complicated draft, so it'll take a little while to take it through. The upper line, the blue line, is the number of people in the world who are in genuine poverty the billion or so I talked about. And in 2007-8, for the first time, the 30 to 40 year decline in the real price of food suddenly reversed. You suddenly got a big blip in food prices. Um, and in that context, 100 million people went into poverty. And I remember at the time pointing this out when I gave this perfect storm speech, and said, this is a worry. And I remember talking to some economists from the Food and Agriculture Organization, oh, we've seen this before. The supply side will deal with it. There's not a real problem. And in 2011, food prices reached the highest they've ever been. Um, and, the, and a further 40 to 50 million people went into poverty. This is, so the food system and it's is failing on hunger. The, the purple line is, the, is essentially the was a very optimistic line in the sense it was showing the proportion of the world population that was actually in poverty, showing that decline, but that decline reversed. The, the green dotted line indicates the Millennium Development Goals, which if you achieve them, would have actually significantly brought down poverty um, to a, a relatively modest proportion of the world population by 2015. And that was the Millennium Development Goals. No hope, no hope now. So the system is failing. And we can't really fail, we can't help, because if this happened in the uh, tail end of the 19th century or in the, er, or in the early decades of the 20th century, we would chop down forests and make more arable land, we would exploit new fisheries, we would find new sources for producing food. And the graph I've shown there is just an indication of the way in which, essentially, you know, and it's empirical, but it much can be done in detail behind it, is saying that by and large, to a good approximation, we're not going to have any more arable land. The only way we could generate it would be a significant over-exploitation and cutting down of what is the residual forest cover. And of course, we can't really do that because that affects the climate change issues and would produce vast amounts of greenhouse gases as forests were chopped down for this way. And indeed, the ploughing up of permanent grassland would have a not quite such a large effect, would have a very substantial effect on it. So we have to be thinking that there is not going to be no more land. And again, there's a chance, because the world population is likely to peak, and it is, there is a chance, but we can't take the easy way out. And food security and climate change are linked very closely. So we've got, as I've said, um, greenhouse gas emissions, about 10 to 12% come from um, the basic f operation of um, farming. 30% comes from land conversion, so if you add that in, you're getting 30% of greenhouse gas emissions are due to the, essentially the food system. And of course there are issues, um, methane produced um, 
from, right, from ruminants and rice and nitrous oxide from fertilizers in using fossil fuels. And one of the, the message on there, and one of the things that I'm trying to achieve, is to, to make certain that agriculture and the food system are taken into account in the climate change negotiation. Essential. And still not happening. The world community is not ready for that for some reason. But what we need, therefore, in terms of agriculture, is what I've termed climate smart agriculture. The simple buying of the agreement from developing countries not to cut down their forests with money is a perfectly reasonable transaction. You are saying to a developing country, forego a benefit, we will pay you for foregoing that benefit. The issue with climate change and smart climate, smart, climate smart agriculture is that you can actually think of, develop agricultural systems and this is, doesn't involve just high-tech stuff, you know, clever things to have plants from plant breeding that will provide plants that will sequester carbon dioxide, for example, or um, fix, uh, fix nitrogen. You can do that by relatively simple ways, and this is a picture of a project in Mozambique, in which effectively we're going to look to, and I hope this is going to be successful and accepted by the international community, that we need to pay farmers to operate climate smart agriculture in which they will get reasonable profits, reasonable benefits, the efficiency of the agriculture can, can go up, but at the same time they will be mitigating and indeed in some cases sequestering carbon dioxide. And that's climate smart agriculture is really, I believe, one of the futures of the world because it has a win-win. It's not saying forego a benefit, it's saying do it in a little way and you get an extra benefit. Enormously important. But of course, as I said, you can't d think about food without thinking about water. And the sort of bullet points on the left-hand side are slightly sal salutary. Um, they're quite startling in terms of the, in, you know, our everyday lives. Give or take, um, we need about three and a half thousand litres, reduce enough food for a daily minimum, 3,000 calories. A kilo of rice two to five thousand. When you get to livestock and, ham and for example, the development of hamburger, it's about 11,000 litres of water to produce a hamburger. Um, you know, of course, below air spurious accuracy, I'm sure I could just debate with McDonald's whether it's 9,340 or with um, uh, certain NGOs whether it's 15,000, but by and large it gives you a feeling for about it. For about it. And agriculture and the use of, of water is going to be so important. Um, the gra the uh, graphs show how the use of water is going to be dominated by agriculture into the future. And there is no reason to expect it. We, of course, have got to be more efficient. Some of the extraction industries um, use vast amounts of water and actually and pollute it. The new, the new technique for shale gas, which is seen as a major benefit for the energy industry, uses vast amounts of water and pollutes it in cracking, um, in cracking rock to produce, uh, produce the gas. But we've got to think about that water. And as I'd said earlier, and this is to repeat, um, our water consumption is just not sustainable. This is, Saudi Arabia is a sort of cheap target in the sense that obviously they haven't got enough water. The, um, the, the aerial photographs show the sort of green development that actually occurs as they are using water in aquifers to actually feed, veget um, to produce farmland and vegetation. The circles indicate the, um, the challenge that's on. This is really difficult and we need to ponder it. And it's not just Saudi Arabia. If you look at Northwest India or indeed Southwest USA, similar problems are occurring. And there are things we can think about doing. And this is, you know, I'm chief scientific advisor and I'm supposed to be responsible for, in the UK, for all science and engineering, you know, no mean task. Um, uh, but there are quite smart things that one can do using high tech. Um, and this is some things, for example, of harvesting, uh, fog harvesting on the um, uh, Namibian and South African West Coast using completely new techniques. And to an extent, science and engineering can help solve some of these problems, but also we've got to be thinking about how we can avoid waste of water. And energy, of course, the third pillar of the challenges is how we're actually going to deal with it. Um, there is going to have to be a shift to sustainable energy, but it is quite unimaginable that the uh, developing world will not use coal. I believe the projections, this is from the, International, the World Energy Study, um, which came out last year, 
shows an expectation that China and the rest of the world will increase their energy uh, supply by coal, by fossil fuels, by gas, and that yes, they will have renewables, but the growth that you're actually seeing in particularly China and India and Africa will mean that we are going to see more um, production of, green, of, of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And of course, we've seen um, in the last two months the issues around nuclear, um, I believe grossly exaggerated. Um, I think I, uh, I, I was asked to uh, advise the UK government on um, whether we should abandon our embassy in Tokyo and whether we should advise our um, citizens to leave the country or not travel there. And we did the calculations and worked in, uh, did the calculations and found it in the worst case possible scenario. And I mean the worst case, everything going up in the plant in Fukushima and the weather flowing in the direction of Tokyo um, would was uh, um, about equal to the um, uh, two CT scans. Um, <laughs> To give you an idea, I went to, to I went to close to the plant, not to the plant itself, um, and I picked up what are two micro sieverts. I had a radiation monitor because we are very careful about our civil servants in government these days, and I picked up two micro sieverts visiting the close vicinity of the plant. And I got ten on the plane coming back. <laughs> it's nonsense. There are many reasons why one might seek not to have nuclear power, but the scientific dangers of it are nonsensical. Uh, there is none. That you've got it, that you're the immediate vicinity of the plant, major problems with evacuation and so on. But you know, I think I think George Monbiot in an article said nobody died, and this was the stupidest design of a nuclear plant, put in the stupidest place that you could ever imagine on a fault with the potential of tsunami, with no planning. They planned for a tsunami of six meters, and they got 14. And you could have predicted it actually from the historical record, so they're culpable on that. But I don't think this is a reason for pulling out a nuclear. A diversion, forgive me. I'm, this is a bit of an obsession at me at the moment. <laughs> but there are also quite nice ways that we can actually think about it. And um, I do think that sort of scientists and engineers are really rather important. And there's some smart things that you can actually do to think about cleaner energy. The most important by far is in the middle. This is capturing carbon dioxide from power plants, whether those are powered by gas or coal or indeed biomass, and sequestering it in reservoirs. Um, and the, te the technology exists, but it's not, it's not at a level where anyone is going to bring it in because it's too expensive, and there's big investments in it. UK government has put a billion aside to invest in pilot plants to, de to develop carbon capture and storage. And there's other things you can do. The UK is focusing on offshore wind. Um, uh, I'm not sure that a solar array, even in Cornwall, is going to be quite, um, quite enough to uh, sort of drive the um, energy requirements in the United Kingdom, but um, offshore wind may have some contribution. And of course you can do smarter things on demand. The, um, the building that's shown on the left is one of these little ironies of life, that it is indeed a, a well-designed zero energy building, but it was actually designed for the tobacco company of China. Um, uh, so you know, one, um, these, as I say, one of the ironies that one can, en one can enjoy. So I'm coming to the, la the end now, and I think the other, uh, other driver that is going, it's not a driver, it's going to be a consequence of our failure to address water, food, energy, security, and climate change. We've got to have an expectation that migration, international migration will increase. And to an extent, I think it's rather important that this is seen as potentially a good there is a demographic di dividend. There is a potential, we have a, you know, this, in this conference on aging, we have got to be thinking in a more positive way about migration. And there's a foresight study um, that I'm directing, which will come out on the future of migration in the, uh, in the autumn. So to conclude, I'm going to conclude from Einstein, because I'm a scientist. Um, and I think it's a, a rather profound statement from Einstein, as a, he made many profound statements, but it's the significant challenges we face can't be resolved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. Thank you for your attention.